to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Max, what's up, my man? Hey, chilling. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, brother. Yeah, I like the increasing frequency with which with which I'm seeing you. It's good. I know. Yeah. We're making it. We're making shit happen. Well, you spend like I feel like every other week in LA. Uh huh. And uh, and I love Austin. I'm here, you know, with increasing uh, frequency. So yeah, it's good. It's I'm loving it. That's good. Um, this is pretty rad because we've both published books through the same publisher that are similar and different enough that there's like lots of shit to talk about lots of shit so the last podcast was really about foods but now you've expanded that into just general practices so yeah. like foods being a foundational piece and like all right what about all the other shit yeah exactly you know exactly and i know you did i mean such an eloquent job with your book um own the day own your life such a big fan um but yeah i mean my my approach really is um you know, health span, lifespan, cognitive health, that's a big topic of my, like a big passion um, area for me because all of my work pretty much is motivated by the fact that my mom got sick at a young age. Yeah. And, you know, I don't say that with any hesitation. Um, you know, she's really the, the impetus for me to have written my first book. She, uh, unfortunately, she passed away while I was writing this book. And her journey has caused me to look at the world in a new way mm. in, a, in a much more critical way and when i wrote my first book it was really meant to be a nutritional care manual for the brain it's what it was um because your mother passed away from alzheimer's right no so here's the here's the fucked up thing is she had a form of dementia that she was diagnosed with in about 2011 that was called Lewy body dementia which is basically like having alzheimer's and parkinson's at the same time it's uh -huh. a it's a horrible condition um, and she suffered with that for about seven to eight years. And then it was Labor Day 2018. I had just gotten back to LA from, uh, it was my first ever experience at Burning Man. So I went to Burning Man for the first time. I got back to LA. I was super, you know, enlivened and inspired by the experience. And literally the day that I got back, I got a call from my brother that my mom was in the emergency room and uh, she had turned yellow she had become jaundiced and when that happens typically you know a doctor might expect to find a gallstone um, which causes a pigment called bilirubin to back up into the blood seep into the skin and the whites of the eyes and cause that color in people but i basically you know without waiting for the for the diagnosis i changed my flight i beelined back to new york city i ran straight to the emergency room and they had just given her an mri of her abdomen and at that point she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer stage mm. four and so that is ultimately what took her life and it was mm. freaking brutal yeah um and that occurred yeah i had just started writing this this new book and so it's a little bit broader than dementia prevention it's more about how to live long and healthily and how to reduce risk for cardiovascular disease for cancer given what we currently know about cancer prevention yeah um i want to get into all that i think yeah. i think for me I, this is an interesting thing that i want to explore is so I'm very much into the optimization of now, you know, like, but I have a hard time projecting into the old version of me and caring about the extension of my life into my older years. I'm kind of like, yeah, I just, if the next 20 are good, like yeah. I feel good. Like I'm not someone who like puts money in, you know, the 401k mm -hmm. and is like figuring out like, oh yeah, like oh, this will be good for later. Uh, it's an interesting characteristic and I'm curious about you. Like, do you think about, cause I know a lot of people are really kind of a, very focused on that. Like longevity is like a big deal. You know, like I wanna live long and I wanna be, and maybe that has to do more with like this kind of paternal thing where you wanna have your kids and then you wanna have, you see your kids have kids. And then so longevity has a priority. That's a little bit different. I mean, I absolutely 100 percent want to feel as good and as healthy as i can right now which i do believe in turn will create more longevity outcomes but 
the priority on longevity from a psychological perspective. Like, do you feel that and why? Yeah, I mean, think about how, you know, how horrible it is to stub your toe you know, like on your bedpost or whatever. And how just like... Yeah, when you just catch toe. the pinky. Yeah, when you just catch the pinky. Thing. Yeah. You know what? If anybody's making beds and they have the ones that flare out at the bottom, fuck you. Pad those fucking things. Fuck you. No, don't ever design those. <laughs> Take all of those beds and be like, this is the bad design. Like it should go straight down. Yeah. Whatever bedpost you have, straight down. And ideally within the bed so that you don't just run into it because if it flares out you're not going to remember that it flares out yeah for the sake of toes everywhere <laughs> but it like it'll ruin your day and i mean if that's just your toe think about what it's like to suffer with a, with a chronic disease it's just miserable and you I suffer get it. you know i get and, it and and it's for these are lo long drawn out processes and i feel like i would just start i would start wingsuit proximity flying if that was the case because yeah. then the adrenaline would take me out of the fucking discomfort and maybe i would just hit a rock yeah maybe put i mean get put out of your misery i you know i mean i, I don't know how i would react i don't know either yeah you know i like i don't i don't really but i understand that is a that's definitely one of the one of those deep fears is these longer things so um i guess if i really sat with that and be like no fuck i really don't want that and you know what the truth is when i am 60 70 80 90 whatever I'm going to I'm going to love life then too. Yeah. And we're aging slower, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to look like the the way that a 90-year-old looks today. I think you'll probably end up being more youthful in mind and body given what we currently know about aging. Um Yeah, and the way the way most people are aging today is we've got, you know, these really long disease spans at the end of our lives, you know? It's not like our we have these compressed health spans and then we've got really lengthy um, times at the end of our life where we're sick, decrepit, frail, disabled, depressed. Um, and then after all that to die, you know, it's just like this, this tragic state of affairs. I think it's, it's way more, um, it's, it's way more noble and way better. It's a way better goal to, I think, try to optimize your health span and then to just kind of go when the time is right. And maybe mm. we'll get to a point where we'll be able to opt out when we want because what my mom experienced at the end of her life, I mean, it really got me thinking about physician-assisted suicide. Not that that's what she would have wanted, not that that's what we would have wanted, but um, to to suffer like that, I think, is is truly inhumane. And Yeah, I mean, in my own spiritual practice, understanding that death is just a transition it's not the end mm -hmm. and it's not something that i can impart on anybody else to believe because this is experiential i'm not taking anybody's word from it from my own journeys i've seen what to me feels you know very much like this is the transition of the unborn and undying consciousness that moves on to a next plane of existence so i think that that idea the idea that i would stay keep myself trapped in this plane of existence I would, I would want to do everything I could because I think life here is fucking beautiful and the connections we make and the people we have and the gifts that we can share and do everything you can. But if you, be, you find something that's completely untenable, hmm. you know, at that point, what are you hanging on for when the next phase is also beautiful? Yeah. You know, so there's, there it is a very interesting question to explore from like this kind of metaphysical perspective. That's why I love talking to people like you, because it's it's it is a very soothing way to think about about death, and um, and I hope that that's the you know I hope that that's the case that you know well, that, that's energy the, is that's just the, transferred. That's the problem I think is like so many people, a lot of people turn to religion in their in the last years because they're like, well, I want some other opinion that's going to tell me about an afterlife. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would ever trust that opinion, but what I can trust is traveling to the place where I've left my physical. The, I've left the role of the one playing Aubrey and merged into something else that was far greater than the one playing Aubrey. The witness of the one playing Aubrey and the witness is, you know, is the one that is unborn and undying. And I, I've felt that. I've felt that in such a way that even though I would not expect anybody else, even anybody listening, to believe me or take my word for it, I feel like, oh, I know that. Hmm. I know it because I've been there and I've felt it. And of course, I could be wrong, but I, I know it, you know, myself. Yeah. And uh and I think that's that definitely reframes the way that you can kind of look at these things. Yeah. Maybe maybe soften some of that fear and mm -hmm. anxiety. But nonetheless, the prerogative to stay as healthy and happy and thriving for as long as possible 
because it's so awesome here. Yeah. Yeah, it is so awesome here. I mean, whether it's music or, you know, exercise for those of us that enjoy doing fitness, which I know you do, which I do. Um, yeah, there's there's so much marrow to be sucked out of life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I regret that my mom was not able to live more of it and, and to have more years healthy and vibrant. But, um, but you know, looking at, at the factors that surrounded my mom, the environmental factors that may or may not have contributed to my mom's diseases, uh, you know, has really caused me to look at the world in a different way and to kind of try to unearth the areas in people's lives where they might be able to make incremental improvements that are going to that are going to help them. Yeah. Um, and I never claim to know everything. And, you know, I'm certainly, I'm approaching this not as a, uh, you know, a, you know, with a background in academia or medicine, but as a concerned citizen, maybe a citizen scientist, certainly as a journalist, but somebody who really just thinks that, you know, you shouldn't have to be a PhD or an MD to know how food, for example, is going to affect your biology, how light is going to affect your biology. I think this is something that like all human beings ought to know about mm. at the very least because it's fucking cool it's yeah. like fascinating and interesting that you know each of us are heir to this incredible legacy you know like we go to museums and we gawk at artifacts of time past right all you need to do is look in a mirror and see this legacy you know that you've carried the torch for after millions of years i mean we've been anatomically modern humans for what two hundred thousand years but i mean this is like there's a, a long line of darwinian struggle and you are the flag bearer at this point, and you've got to know how to take care of that that responsibility. Yeah, which is yeah, it's a it's a beautiful way to look at it, and and also when you're in touch with that wilder side of yourself, where you're actually able to listen to the way that the body is communicating and understand that the body is always sending signals, and instead of this idea like ah, oh, my body's tired, must be broken, no, 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 the fatigue is a signal. Mm. You know, like, oh, this thing hurts. Ah, my fuck, I, let me take a painkiller. My body's broken. It's like, no, 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 this is a signal. It's like an a, like animals know that. You yeah. know, they don't have the thought process and the removal of self and the wit and like the watcher of self to say like, oh, well, my body's, you know, fucking stupid and does this. It's like a dog when it needs to eat grass will eat grass because that's going to somehow, I don't know why they do it, but it'll somehow like fix their stomach. Cause them to throw up. Or, yeah, whatever yeah. whatever the thing that they need to do, they're like, I'm going to do this thing. I never eat grass, but today I'm going to eat grass. Yeah. You know, and you just watch dogs do it and you're like, uh, I guess my dog's fucked up, uh, and but he knows it and he's cool with it and he's just going to eat grass until whatever that creates whatever result but there's like an in intuition that they have that they're more in tune with and i think helping people not only with the information but also with that that intuition that intuitive knowing of the wild self yeah they also eat poop so do mice probably to get some b12 yeah yeah because the <laughs> the bacteria in the gut creates sure. b12 but you don't absorb it down there so it's probably yeah coprophagia it's pretty gnarly um yeah we shouldn't have to be like dogs you know, I think that we've got other check engine lights that we yeah, can we don't need into. to eat poop. Yeah, we don't. Need but to eat we poop. should be able to know when we need something, and then like poop is a is a poor solution to solve a problem, but it's the solution that's available for the dog. Well, we're humans. We got fucking Amazon.com or whatever yeah. fuck we want, or a place that we can travel, or a thing we can do, or breath work we can. We got so many tools that we can use that are better than poop. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I think that's you know, a big part of what. You're talking about here in, in the genius life yeah. it's like what are these tools that we can start to use when our body is sending signals yeah well sleep is a huge one um i was completely underslept yesterday and uh it was my own fault i think i ate a little bit too much 95 percent dark chocolate the night the, the night prior which you know dark chocolate has caffeine and theobromine and theobromine theobromine being a cardiac stimulant that's fat soluble that lasts like eight hours damn i screwed myself you screwed yourself yeah so yesterday i was like wired and tired all day i was just like i was i mean i still was able to do the things that i needed to do but um but last night yeah i prioritized sleep so that's one of the things that i talk about in the book i give a ton of of, of science-based tips that people can use to optimize the rejuvenating aspects of sleep to you know um, maximize their sleep opportunity sleep i think is one of those things that you can't uh you know, underappreciate at your own peril because it's really this master regulator of so many processes in the body 
that are crucial for feeling good, for you know having uh, a long, healthy life. It's the lever that moves the most things. Yeah, from inflammation to fat loss to to health to longevity to mood to I mean it. It's the one lever that we can adjust that will affect the broadest number of factors. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think there's anything else. Yeah. It's to use a metaphor from Game of Thrones. Um, at the end of Game of Thrones, is you know the show's over, so I don't think this is spoiling it for anybody. You've got to kill the Night King so that all the zombie White Walkers fall. Mm -hmm. Getting optimizing your sleep is the equivalent of killing the Night King. It's it really is the one thing that's going to help you do everything else properly in your life, whether it's making the right choices when it comes to mealtime. Mm. You know, because when you're underslept, you're you tend to crave more carbs and fat, more junk foods. In fact, you eat on average about 400 more calories on a day that you're underslept. Mm -hmm. um, it's the you know the time during the day in which we our brains literally clean themselves of toxic proteins like amyloid beta, um, which uh, you know amyloid is the is the protein that forms the backbone of the plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, to the degree that on one night of poor sleep, you have about 30% higher levels of amyloid beta in your cerebrospinal fluid the next day. Um, same with tau protein, which gets misfolded in Alzheimer's disease. So, I mean, your What's brain- What's that gonna, so I understand those from the long-term perspective, what does that feel like in the immediate? Well, I'm not sure that you could feel it necessarily, but they can measure it, which, you know, it is suggested that having more of that protein around is going to increase the odds that it's going to aggregate and misfold and, and clump up. Yeah. So that's, it's, it is still more of a long term play. But I wonder, because when you're sleepy, like your brain just doesn't fire the right way. Yeah. Well, that actually, could be an inflammation thing. Or well, it could be yeah. A, yeah. I mean, amyloid is not a bad thing. So amyloid actually might increase in its concentration as a response to inflammation. They're doing a lot of research now at Harvard in the lab of uh, Rudy Tanzi, who is, you know, he's one of the foremost Alzheimer's researchers who's, who's found that amyloid can actually trap viruses in the brain, like the herpes virus, um, to sort of immobilize it uh, or... Um, you know, lessen its potential to cause harm in the brain. And so amyloid might actually be a response to um, inflammation or inflammatory, inflammatory insults in the brain. They also find amyloid in the brains of younger people exposed to high levels of air pollution. So it's another topic that I cover in the book, how to, you know, what to do to protect yourself if you live in, a, in an area with a lot of air pollution, because um, certain particles in the air, which uh, the particles um, are at a size where they would be be called fine particulate matter, 2.5 micrometers or smaller, can actually get into circulation, pierce the blood br blood brain barrier, and end up in the brain where amyloid seems to also trap the particles, mm. like magnetite. So you'll see you'll see amyloid plaques in the brains of younger people in really polluted parts of the world. So it's not that amyloid is necessarily um, a bad thing. It's sort of similar to the cholesterol story where we need cholesterol. Cholesterol is important. Um, but we do see it at the scene of the crime in atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, so that's the it's thing. It's just is, what causes that cholesterol to right. form that, that's, that we've gotten the misconception about, thinking yeah. that it's actually dietary cholesterol that's causing these high levels of cholesterol when it's really fucking sugar. Right. Yeah, you know, sugar, inflammation. All these other things um, that are actually causing the negative effects of cholesterol. Exactly. That we're finding. It's not that you're eating egg yolks. <laughs> you exactly. Know? But so there's an interesting thing that you're mentioning there is because, you know, in talking with Dr. Dan Engel, he's, he made a really big point about, you know, we think of things like yeast in the gut. We think of things like parasites. And we think of those as purely negative, candida in the gut. And they do have some certainly negative effects. But they also serve a role in that they trap a lot of heavy metals and they trap a lot of toxins that are in the gut. So if you're eating a lot of heavy metals and you're putting a lot of toxins in your body, you're naturally gonna have a higher likelihood to have more candida, more parasites, which are gonna be holding these things for you and kind of like quarantining these negative particles. And it sounds like amyloid is kind of like the brain's version yeah. of that same thing. But ultimately th these are, you know, depletive over time yeah yeah so i mean sleep not sleeping not giving your brain the rest that it requires might actually be causing neuronal injury that causes this increase in the production of amyloid protein so it's not again necessarily that amyloid is the is the villain and in fact i mean this is why 99.6 percent of alzheimer's drug trials fail because they use amyloid as a target 
Um, and what they find is that when they do develop these antibodies that reduce levels of amyloid in the brain, they don't cure Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there's just big, you know, expensive trial after expensive trial that just report dismal results. So the amyloid is correlative, but not causative. Correct. And so if you're attacking something that's correlative, but it's not causative, then right. you're wasting your time. Yeah. And so the question for Alzheimer's researchers really has shifted to like, what is the earliest thing that is going to go, that goes awry in the brain that we can target as a way of, of reducing risk for Alzheimer's disease? So, I mean, I think, you know, amyloid certainly plays a role, especially in the, in the later stages, you know, mm -hmm. because I think that the aggregation of these plaques is probably not helping, you know, the, the ailing Alzheimer's brain, but um, I think it's probably, I think it's probably appearing there as a result of other things. So yeah. whether it's air pollution, which, you know, researchers speculate that air pollution might make up, might be responsible for 20% of Alzheimer's cases, if not more. So let's talk about air pollution because there's like different levels of air pollution. You know, there's like Austin city air pollution, pretty chill, it seems like, but I don't know. I'm not an air pollution expert. And then you go to like you know, the val sometimes in the valley or Hollywood out in LA and it's like a thick, dense smog. And then you can go to, you know, Guangzhou in China and then you see like another level mm. of fucking air pollution. There's like, there's like varying degrees. Where do you think the line is where it's like, all right, this is, this is time to move. <laughs> you know, like, like Mexico yeah. city supposedly has really bad air pollution. I haven't been. That's where they've done these studies. Yeah. Mexico city where these children, they're, they look in the brains of, you know, uh, of, of cadavers essentially. And they find that there's Alzheimer's like pathology in their brains. And it's not because, you know, it's not even necessarily because they're eating too much junk food or they're sedentary, which, you know, we know that those are independently related to, uh, worse brain health as well. But, um, yeah, it's the, it's the air pollution. And so there's ozone. The two primary forms of air pollution that we have in the United States are ozone and fine particulate matter, fine particulate matter. Wait, ozone is bad. Ozone is, I mean, yeah, if you, you know, if oh, you, no. if, if you breathe in excessive amounts of it. Yeah. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of alternative and I don't know the science behind this at all, but there's like a whole host of alternative medicine that uses ozone therapy. Is that, is that, is that misguided in your opinion? Um, I don't know enough about what they're claiming and how they're using it and what they're using it for. Neither do I. To comment on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's probably a U-shaped scenario like everything else in life, like oxygen. We need oxygen to live, but it's also it can be poisonous if the you know, if it's too concentrated. Yeah. Um so I'm not uh and you know, oxygen oxidizes things, so it also makes things age and decay. Um so I don't know about what they're using ozone for. I think they're using it for, you know, antibacterial, antimicrobial, mm -hmm. anti I think it's short-term dose of this, the O3 molecule, which is somehow um, antagonizing to some of these other microbial particles. Hypothetically, yeah. you know, this is, again, we're going off, we're, we haven't researched this subject, so <laughs> please nobody call us out because we, I really don't know anything about that. But, yeah. it is, but it is an interesting, it is interesting to think. So what are the effects of air pollution that cause ozone to become concentrated? Because it seems like ozone would be more present in a, in a forest or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think that the research on ozone is a little bit um, lagging behind the a more direct result of industrial manufacturing, and that is the fine particulate matter. Yeah. Um, and that's the smog. That's the smog. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, those are actual particles of, you know, metals and minerals and, and things like that that are in the air that we breathe, like magnetite, um, which is made of essentially iron. Uh, these are, you know, it's, it's all in the air as a result of car exhaust, the burning of garbage, of, you know, other just industrial processes um, sloughed off from, uh, from manufacturing and yeah, where else is, I mean, it's just, it's sort of omnipresent. Yeah. You can, um, pl you know, plastics, dust, things like that. I mean, dust makes up fine particulate matter. This is actually one of the reasons why house dust is, can, can actually be more, um, uh, a, a more concentrated source of air pollutants than the outside environment because of, of dust that sloughs off from our, uh, electronics, um, so if you're like if you're shaking out a rug, yeah, you may want to like hold your breath, yeah, 
or like put on a fucking mask. Yeah, I mean a lot of because that shit is bad. Yeah, it's bad. It's like made of of you know they use phthalates and BPA and things like that. Um, flame retardants. Uh, we talked about flame retardants on the on the last episode, but the fact that flame retardants are now used in our furniture and our mattresses and things like that. Um, we used to consider these compounds inert, but we actually now know that they slough off. They form the dust in our homes. We breathe them in. It's also heavy metals like iron, uh, not iron, um, lead, which has been used in house paint prior to 1978. Mm -hmm. So if you live in a home that was built prior to 1978, there's a good chance that there is still lead um, being used in the in the paint in your house. And if it's just the paint on a wall, it's probably not something to be concerned about. But if it's on, you know, like the uh, like a windowsill or the banister in your stairwell, like high friction, high touch points of the in the house, um, that these paints can create dust, can enter circulation. Mm. You can also find it accumulated in the soil around your homes. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a problem. But going back to air pollution, yeah, they found that these particles can actually can obviously they enter your lungs, they can enter circulation. They can cross up, up into the brain. They also have a, a, a negative effect on cardiovascular function, like um, heart rate variability. Um, they can induce inflammation. Um, as I mentioned, they can increase uh, pathologies that are associated with Alzheimer's disease in the brain. All right, so what do we do? Yeah. So what do we do? Well, I think it's really important to just be cognizant of the kinds of products that you're allowing to enter your house for one. So what I mean, if it's just generally in the air? Yeah. Well, for that, I think the the burden of toxicity and how that how those how the uh, pollution is affecting your health um, actually depends to a large degree on your overall nutrient status. So, if you're consuming a diet that's rich in antioxidants and contains ample omega threes, and you know you're eating your fruits and vegetables, you're getting adequate vitamin C, vitamin E, and things like that. Um, you're consuming cruciferous vegetables that that um, that have the ability to create sulforaphane which is a potent activator of our body's NRF2 detox pathway, um, that you're going to be pretty safe. You're going to be pretty protected. Even so though, that's, the, that's the kind of, that's the remedy yeah. to this kind of universal air pollution. Yeah. It's kinda. building up your own resilience, I right. think. You know, unless you want to like move to the woods, um, which I think is impractical for most people. And certainly there's something, there are many, many good things to be gained living in the world's large cities. Um, that are probably going to be more air, more you know, have higher uh, levels of air pollution. I think the best thing that you can do is to become more resilient, and the best way to do that, there are a few ways, but um, primarily you want to eat a diet that is rich in antioxidants. Um, cruciferous vegetables are really important in terms of stoking your body's detox pathways, mm -hmm. while also supplying the raw materials to create um, endogenous detoxifier compounds like glutathione. Um, and there are there have been some clinical trials that I, I detail in the book uh, in China where they've used compounds like they've used fish oil and they've seen that fish oil was able to negate some of the deleterious uh, effects that air pollution has on um, on, uh, on on inflammatory markers in the body. They've also tested compounds like sulforaphane mm -hmm. um, in an elderly population and they find that sulforaphane helps the body better excrete compounds like benzene and acreolin. Which are carcinogens and that are you know ever present in in a so it just improves the ability to detox to detox. I think that's one of the reasons why I think I've been so fond of the krill oil. I mean, I've found that to be like a huge benefit because it not only has the EPA DHA that is the signature of the fish oil, but the astaxanthin I'm as a, huge. a a potent antioxidant. Yeah, I'm a huge astaxanthin fan. Yeah, in and of itself, so you're getting like this kind of extra additional triple threat. And they don't have to put like extra vitamin E in there as the antioxidant, which they put in a lot of the fish oil, which then there's some questionable research around additional exogenous vitamin E, you know, when it's added to different things. But Just don't smoke it. Yeah. <laughs> don't vape it. Yeah, don't vape vitamin E. <laughs> yeah, because that's where people, that's why all these people are getting, there's like vitamin E acetate, I believe, in the, in the vape compounds. And that's what no the FDA has identified as being why so many people are getting like sick from it. So yeah. they're also huffing so fucking much vape. Like yeah. if you go to like YouTube or TikTok and you watch like oh some God. some vape videos, people making like things that would make the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland jealous. It's insane with their vape clouds. Um, but yeah, I'm a huge. I've always, I've for a very long time been an astaxanthin fan. Yeah, uh, it's the pigment found in marine animals like wild salmon, 
um, crustaceans. It's uh, what algae create. Algae are literally sitting on the surface of the, of the pond, and so they're enduring massive amounts of oxidative stress from the sun. So they create astaxanthin as like a defense compound to protect you know, them against, you know, so that they can keep their DNA um, replete. And so when we consume astaxanthin, it's this really interesting molecule that like basically what it does is it's able to protect cells from the inside out. And it's also really good as a sort of internal sunscreen. Mm. Like you take it, it protects you against photo aging, um, oxidative stress. It's really good for the brain. It's also been found to activate longevity pathways, like the FOXO3 longevity pathway by like 90%. Um, so astaxanthin is awesome. Big fan. You just mentioned the sun. Light has got to be a big issue here, right? Yeah. Because like it's one of the best ways for the body to produce vitamin d it's you can get it you can get it in ingestible forms and there's different ways that we can do that of course and but through the sun is yeah. like the is like the primary way that we're able to access you know our own production of vitamin d and i think the sun has been somewhat villainized totally based on this whole skin cancer kind of a concept yeah but yeah what are your what do you what do you write about here and what are your thoughts on the sun yeah, I talk about the sun a lot. The sun has medicinal value and few of us get enough of it. I mean, 93% of people today spend time indoors, which is treacherous given everything that I just said about how polluted our indoor air environment can be. Um, so I offer ways of, of cleaning up the air in your you know, indoor environment. You can wet dust, uh, which is really important as opposed to dry dusting, which just redistributes dust. You can use a, an air filter and things like that. But getting out into the sun is is crucial. So I mean, vitamin D, obviously our sun creates it, uh, our skin creates it when uh, we're exposed to the vitamin, to the UVB rays from the sun. Um, it's a steroid hormone that in the body activates about 5% of our genome. Every uh, organ has receptors for vitamin D, called the vitamin D receptor. Um, and there have been some interesting connections between vitamin D and autoimmunity, um, neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so, I talk about how important that is, but to try to whittle down the benefits of sun exposure to just the fact that it helps us create vitamin D, I think is just uh, another example of the, you know, hubris where we try to like kind of distill everything into its, you know, functional parts. You know, very narrow-minded materialist yeah. reductionist way of looking at sun exposure. Exactly. But the vitamin, uh, why do I keep saying, I keep, you know, swapping UV rays for vitamin i don't know why but um maybe there's something yeah something maybe. to that well i've been in austin for the past two days and i haven't even seen the sun <laughs> no, that's which a you know being in texas i'm kind of you know surprised by that but anyway so the uva rays from the sun actually have also been demonstrated to increase nitric oxide in the body which is um really great for opening up your capillaries boosting blood flow lowering blood pressure uh and things like that i talk about the role of bright light as a, a means of anchoring your body's circadian clock, which is super important. Um, I do, I think, a pretty thorough uh, look into what we currently know about circadian biology and how important getting good light is in the first half of the day. Yeah. Um, do, do you notice with your books, because that's one of the things I talk about and own the day, is like it's yeah. chapter one, morning mineral cocktail, rehydration, sea salt, some lemon if you have it, get some light, get some movement, set your circadian biology right. And like, that's by far the thing that people talk about the most. But I wonder if that's because it's the most important thing or whether people have just read one chapter. Of my that's book. a good point. Yeah. You know, it's like, ah, I made it through chapter one. Yeah. Good to go. That's you know? a good point. Yeah. Um, I think it's super important. Yeah. Every topic that I cover in this book can easily fill up its own book. You know, mm -hmm. um, I tried to give a 30,000 foot view to give people sort of the most actionable and approachable and achievable guide, you know, given, given the state of the science. And I've, I have, I own books, you know, entire books on circadian biology and nature immersion and all that stuff. But I like, like you just explained, I mean, I kind of like, I'll read the first chapter or two and then I get bored of it because you yeah. can fit all of the science basically, you know, you can fit the prescription into a chapter. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I mean, getting back to light, I think it is one of those really important things. I mean, a, a significant portion of our genome is influenced by our circadian uh our circadian clocks and light has a, a role to play in our mood um how we feel during the day focus attention um it dictates how well we sleep you know the night after our exposure to 
to adequate sunlight, it dictates when melatonin begins to be uh, released into the into the into circulation by the pineal gland, um, and it can also uh, light can also you know undo bright light exposure at the wrong time of day it can actually act like a carcinogen. I talk about as well, which mm. I don't think most people appreciate, but. You know, we live in this world where artificial lighting is sort of everywhere. You can easily walk into a, a drugstore or a supermarket where the overhead lighting is at an intensity that that basically will uh, entrain your brain circadian clock about a thousand lux or higher. Which for a hunter gatherer, I mean, the brightest light that a hunter gatherer would be exposed to would be you know a campfire, the stars in the sky, or a moon. Which none of those reach a light intensity of a thousand lux. So it basically protects your you know your innate circadian um, timekeeper. But now that we you know LED TV screens, the lighting in, in you know drugstores, supermarkets can easily confuse uh, that timekeeping system, and what that does is it suppresses melatonin from being released, which most people are familiar with melatonin. It's a sleep hormone. It helps us get good rest, but it's not just that. It's also one of the most powerful antioxidants in the body. Um, it's a gatekeeper to the process known as autophagy, which is sort of like, you know, the, uh, I call it the con biology's KonMari method, where, uh, you know, your cells tidy up, they clean house. And this is one of the reasons why um, it's been proposed that night shift workers have uh, a pretty dramatically increased risk for certain cancers mm. um, because they're basically not allowing their melatonin to do its job, you know, which is to help um, our cell, our cells essentially clean up uh, dysfunctional proteins, organelles, and things like that, uh, repair DNA, um, which, you know, DNA damage is at the root of, of tumor genesis and things like that. So um, the, at the wrong time of day, bright light can actually be a toxin. Mm. Um, well, yeah. that's a couple of things. What else? Yeah. What are the other things in here? Um, so there's a pretty deep dive into the relation. I, the way that I think about this book, it's about relationships. It's like the relationship between the brain and the body and the body and the external environment. Um, so light, sun, timing of when we eat. I do talk about nutrition. Chapter one is actually, a. a um, it's sort of a, an updated guide to how to eat for primarily better body composition and better metabolic health. So here in this book, what I do is I put the, the focus on protein, which I think is really important. People like us in the fitness world kind of know that protein is a valuable micronutrient to say the least. Um, but this is not something that I think the population at large is really aware of, especially when they're being fed uh, misinformation by the media left and right that we're eating too much protein as it is, or that protein is somehow not good for us, or it's bad for the kidneys, yada, yada, mm -hmm. which none of those, none of those things are true. Um, so I talk about why protein should be sort of at, you know, front and center at every meal as a way of satiating your hunger, which is something that, um, has become pretty dysfunctional today. Our hunger m regulatory mechanisms are all out of whack because of our over-reliance on packaged processed foods. So I say that when you're eating prioritized protein and not just, um, you know, any protein, but a, a range of proteins that are going to basically give you a nice balance of two amino acids, methionine and glycine. So methionine is concentrated primarily in, uh, muscle meat, which is what most of us tend to eat. So whether it's ground beef or steaks or chicken breast or what have you, those are the, mu that's the muscle tissue of animals that we're consuming. And muscle meat is very concentrated in methionine. Meth methionine is not bad. It's an essential amino acid. Um, but too much methionine, especially in the context of not enough glycine, might actually shorten your lifespan and, and be pro-inflammatory. So what I advocate... Would the, carni would the carnivore diet camp people, would they uh, argue against that? Well, Paul Saladino, who's a uh -huh. brilliant medical doctor, he advocates for nose to tail carnivore. So he's definitely doing it right if you're right. going to do the carnivore diet. So instead of just the muscle meat, you have the organ meat as well. Yeah, you have the organ meat. Which More is higher in glycine. Which higher in glycine. Yeah, glycine Got makes it. up one third of collagen. So whenever you're consuming collagen, about a third of the amino acids are glycine, and then you've got proline and then hydroxyproline. Uh -huh. um, and there are also other amino acids in collagen, like you'll find a tiny amount of leucine but really not uh not a significant amount it's primarily you know the reason to consume collagen is because it's a third glycine um, and glycine is important to buffer methionine and 
It's also rate limiting in the synthesis of glutathione, which we talked about. So glutathione is the body's master detoxifier and antioxidant. And I think that if you're not consuming enough glycine and you're an omnivore and you're consuming lots of methionine, you're probably, um, you're probably negatively uh, impacting your body's ability to create glutathione. Is glutath glutathione, now this is a question that may be better served for somebody who's prepared the research, but I'm yeah. curious because I will take exogenous glutathione intravenously hmm. and it's one of the things that I do that has probably the biggest, it's, it's as far as from a supplemental perspective and from that kind of like overall general lift, like obviously alpha brain is going to get me focused and shroom tech's going to help me work out, total NO is going to build my nitric toxin, I'm going to swallow. Like there's new moods in a row. Like I got all the things, right? Yeah. But like as far as like a general lift where like I know that I did something and I feel just better from it is when I take intravenous glutathione. Hmm. So through like a push or through an IV, like there's a couple different services through Dr. Conover and things that I use for that. Um, but there is some concern about the kind of uh, down regulation of endogenous production with the exogenous addition hmm. of glutathione. And I'm curious if you've encountered that in any of your research. About yeah, that, I don't, I'd like to look into that myself. I would like to, to look more into that. I do, um, you know, I think that the consumption of certain plant compounds like uh, polyphenols, sulforaphane, which is in, you know, as I mentioned, cruciferous vegetables. So polyphenols, berries. Yeah, talking like they, they increase levels of glutathione. Um, mm -hmm in the brain and they don't actually contain glutathione, but they stimulate your body's own production of glutathione. I am not aware of any research that says that, um, the, the, you know, the addition of exogenous glutathione is going to reduce your body's own th synthesis. Sometimes I'll take, uh, like liposomal glutathione, like mm. those little packets. Um, and it feels like it works a little bit, but it's not quite the same because the body yeah. breaks down glutathione. So, so that's the weird thing about the world we live in is mm. like, you're not actually really, according to the FDA, really able to talk about sublingual absorption of things. Hmm. So like, that's not something that you can really promote, but obviously sublingual is a full, whole different factor. Any Or intranasal, like the reason why you snort cocaine, everybody, is because if you swallow it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, you'd have to swallow like a bunch of it. And I don't recommend snorting cocaine. I think it's a, one of the bad drugs. I don't put a lot of drugs in the bad category, but that <laughs> one I think you can pretty clearly put in the bad category. But nonetheless, you put it through your nose because it's absorbed intranasally and then the intranasal absorption, but it's the same thing as sublingual. And that's the way that glutathione, either intranasal glut liposomal glutathione or sublingual glutathione will work a bit because you got to absorb it that way. Because the minute that stuff goes straight into your gut, your gut's going to break it down and it's not going to be glutathione anymore. You're not going to get it to cross the blood brain barrier if yeah. you put it in that pure form. I've heard differently about the liposomal. Like that, it, that it will work through the gut? Yes. But I have not corroborated that with my own uh, you know, assessment of the of the of the literature. I've heard that from the company that like makes the the liposomal glutathione. Right, I, I have. It's certainly definitely it's certainly helpful for most things, even liposomal glu like vitamin C. Yeah, or lipo anything that you can make in that liposomal form is more easily absorbed. So I'm sure it has. It's probably all on a curve. And you talk about these like these curves. Yeah. Of effectiveness. Yeah. And then some things you just need to put right in the blood. Yeah. Uh, or you could be like like Ben Greenfield and put it up your butt. Yeah, intra-anal absorption. <laughs> intra-anal absorption. I think our buddy Kyle probably is also down with any intra-anal absorption that, uh, that is necessary. Yeah, that's one of the best places to absorb stuff. And also when you're looking at toxins, this is a big case that I made and own the day too, is like what you put on your body, you put in your body. Yeah. And there's different levels. And the problem with deodorants is armpits are one of the very sensitive places that actually is a thinner membrane that absorbs more stuff. So you're putting chemical laden deodorants or antiperspirants in one of your most sensitive areas. That's a problem. And you know what else is? Fucking tampons that don't even have to list all of the other oh things that they put inside those. Like they don't even have to list them. You yeah. know, it's like but nonetheless, you're soaking in through one of the thinnest membranes of a woman's body. You're soaking in all of these different sterols and all of these different compounds that you probably don't want inside your body. Yeah. Like you wouldn't suck a tampon fresh out of the, the applicator, right? Because you'd be like, ooh, gross. 
Well, guess what? It's going in your body just the same, just because you don't taste it because your vagina doesn't have taste buds <laughs> doesn't mean that it's not getting in there. Right. And just like you, if you wouldn't lick your speed stick deodorant because it'd be gross and you'd feel the chemicals in your mouth, well, it's going in there anyways if it's going in your armpit. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I, I have a whole chapter in the book where I, I alert people to the environmental toxins that m most of us are exposed to on a daily basis, some of which we've been exposed to for the entirety of our lives. The Environmental Working Group um, found that your average baby today is uh, just inundated with this chemical onslaught in utero, about 200, I believe, 87 industrial chemicals. So this is not just like, you know, chemicals that, you know, that that are would be expected to be found there. But these are like the byproducts of like burning garbage and coal and things like that in utero that babies are exposed to. And then today it's just the onslaught continues you know, to the end of our lives. And so whether it's parabens, which you're talking about, or aluminum, excessive amounts of aluminum, um, I think that we all need to be a little bit more uh, aware and, and a little bit more cautious of these kinds of compounds. I take the approach that we should, we should view them as guilty until proven innocent. You know, I think innocent mm -hmm. until proven guilty is great for, for the justice system, but when it comes to these kinds of compounds to which we're routinely exposed, um, often just testing is, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. You know, sometimes they'll be tested, uh, in animals, maybe they'll be tested in, in humans observationally, but they're not really tested in, in children or pregnant women or things like that. And I think that there's just too many instances throughout history where products have been foisted, uh, into the marketplace before appropriate testing has been done. I mean, I mentioned lead based paints, right? That's just one example. There's asbestos building insula insulation, um, triclosan, which was, you know, found in toothpaste and, and hand, hand sanitizers up until, uh, a few years ago, trans fats, you know, partially hydrogenated oils and things like that. Um, and you know, we wonder why the population is so sick. So I think it's just important to be, uh, without fear mongering and without being too alarmist, just a little bit sort of more, way more mindful. And I think mindful. that's, it's important on that curve, because if you try to cut out a hundred percent, you're going to become neurotic and the neuroses is going to create the down reg through the cortisol and through the stress of everything that you're constantly worried about. That fear and alert state is actually going to suppress your immune system, probably more than the chemicals that you're actually ingesting. So it's this kind of quiet confidence and mindfulness about what you're doing without this exaggerated fear yeah. about everything like huh, what did i do i touched a fucking railing you know like i i went to disneyland and i held the ride <laughs> yeah. when was the ride made you know i was on the matterhorn that thing was made in fuck you're fine yeah you, you ride the matterhorn you're gonna be all right you yeah. know what i mean yeah i mean i think if people can just make a like simple swaps like stop drinking water out of plastic you know and i i'm guilty of it too i just still drink water out of plastic when i'm really thirsty and i have no other no other option. Sure, you got that Fiji bottle in your hotel room and you're like, fuck it. There you go, yeah. But I mean, generally, cutting down on your interaction with plastic, not storing food in plastic, um, <laughs> actually not, uh, there's, they found that um, certain types of dental floss, so like Glide dental tape, actually is made with PFOA, which is essentially what, it's a compound that's used to make Teflon, which is a, a known endocrine disruptor. Um, that that actually can increase levels of, of these compounds in, in one's body. And so you definitely want to floss, but use like more of a string, not the tapes. You know, I, like I've, my dental gum health has improved dramatically. I've, I'm like a huge toothpick guy. So I'll use the toothpicks with like the tea tree oil or like some natural based toothpicks, not like any kind of like just get the whole foods, natural toothpicks. Yeah. And that has made a dramatic improvement because after every meal i'll hit the toothpicks and it's way easier than the floss and way like you can do it socially too like busting out the floss is kind of like yeah this is disruptive to the social dynamics but like you can use a toothpick get in your teeth you're massaging your gums giving them that kind of pressure to create the healthy tissue yeah that you really need to do and keeping that food out of your out of your gums which you don't want to decompose on your gums it creates cavities Especially All sorts of other products. issues. Yeah. 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 Um, I think the massaging of your gums is a really important point. When people today, you know, we base our diets around these ultra processed foods that are essentially pre-digested. It takes no effort for us to, to chew, to assimilate. Um, that's one of the major problems with ultra processed foods, why independent of calories, 
processed foods may be uniquely fattening, and that's because we absorb 100% of the calories in processed foods. Unlike, say, whole foods like whole nuts, the USDA, the USDA actually did a, a reassessment of the calories that we absorb in nuts, whole nuts, and they found that actually a significant uh, percentage of the calories that you might see on a package of nuts, you know, you might look at and say, oh, this package has 100 calories. You're actually absorbing when you eat whole nuts about 70 of those of those 100 calories. And that's mm. because they're whole foods. A lot of those particles make it through your digestive tract, uh, you know, un, undigested, essentially. But then you take nuts and you create nut butter, and you're absorbing 100% of those calories. So, well, especially if it's Jiffy peanut butter, too, because then you got the high fructose corn syrup and all this other bullshit. All the other there. crap. As well, I remember I was so in when I was in my darkness retreat. We we're eating raw vegan food in the dark, and I obviously couldn't see the volume of my shit, but I could tell because it's it's such a high fiber diet when you're that because it's just plates and plates of mostly vegetables and nuts and things of that nature. That I was like, wow, I am shitting way <laughs> more than I should be based on the quantity of eating that I was doing, right? <laughs> And I think it goes to your point, like a lot of that stuff is just kind of passing through and absorbing the nutrients, but it's not like eating Wonder Bread where, you know, you're going to squeak out a little, a little squirt, Yeah, you know, of like, cause most of that is all just sugar that your body's going to intake and then have to deal with and store as fat. Yeah. All sugar, just rapidly absorbed in the small intestine almost as soon as you eat it. Um, I mean, that the breaking down process begins in your mouth with the uh, enzyme amylase in your saliva. And then it leaves very little for the microbiota to ferment, you know, in the large intestine. And we know that when we feed the microbes that live in the large intestine, fibers and things like that, that they release all kinds of beneficial metabolites. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I think, uh, you know, there's two things that I think people should do from a dietary standpoint. I've become less dogmatic about macros um, over time. I think that you're going to get huge wins that you're going to get the most bang for your buck if you just do two things prioritize protein and cut out the ultra processed foods mm. i mean that is just a recipe for satiety right there ultra processed foods we know you know they short circuit your brain's satiety tripwires so they're you know they're, they're not gonna fill you up in fact they make you more hungry um actually and uh and you know there was a great study that was published um funded by the national institutes of health Obesity researcher Kevin Hall found that when people um, were eating primarily ultra-processed foods, they end up ended up when eating to satiety, they ended up eating a calorie surplus of about 500 calories per day, and then eating a whole foods-based diet to the same level of satiety. So it's like ad libitum feeding that they actually came in a calorie deficit. So right there, if you don't want to have to count calories, and who does, you know, try to eat predominantly whole foods and chew and chew. There's great studies. I have like at least three or four studies in the day talking about. The difference in and they've done these studies on obesity and calorie intake and how much food you're eating if you actually just chew and continue and like chew and consciously chew and chew more than you normally would you're gonna actually be way more satiated and have way more access to nutrients now hopefully you're chewing something that's actually good for you yeah. but either way irregardless if you're chewing you're gonna eat less you're gonna absorb more you know the mastication process in and of itself is a huge lift yeah if people just do that yeah it slows down i mean it slows down everything it puts you in that rest or digest mode there's probably a relationship between the degree of processing of a food and the rate of uh you know of mastication yeah you know? nobody nobody chews forever on a pringle exactly exactly you're like chewing it and you're already thinking about the next pringle you're gonna eat <laughs> yeah. or the next food you're gonna eat right I mean, that's how this stuff works so yeah, I think that those are the big the big wins for people. Because, you know, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, you don't want to become obsessed with all this stuff. You're just going to drive yourself crazy. So I tried to kind of, I spent a lot of time thinking about what is the low-hanging fruit? Like what are going to be the little things that people can do that are going to have the biggest wins in terms of their health, how they feel, and their long-term, you know, prospects for good health. And uh, and I think that's it, you know, in terms of, in terms of nutrition, um, it's those two things. It's like not messing around, eating, you know, focusing on protein, which is self-limiting because of how of how satiating it is. It's going to be great for your body composition, um, whether or not you're on a, a weight training regimen. And then cut out the ultra processed foods. I call it like mouth porn. You know, it just <laughs> it creates addiction. Mouth pleasures. We are addicted yeah. to mouth pleasures like we're addicted to genital pleasures. 
hey to a certain degree right and, yeah and like there's the there's the you know the genital pleasures that leave you feeling fulfilled you know making love to somebody you really enjoy or like pleasuring yourself to a certain thing and then there's the times where you're like oh man that was that was something yeah you know i felt something there but i don't know if that was good for me oh man i don't know if that was the i don't know if that was the right choice yeah you know what i mean but it's the same with the mouth you know yeah. like you eat that donut yeah sure you're gonna ramp up that mouth pleasure super high it's the same thing and it's not necessarily that sugar is addicting or that fat is addicting it, i think it's the combination it's when a food becomes hyper palatable and i actually when when writing that chapter in the book i went i looked up articles um about porn addiction and i i read how people who were porn addicts were describing how it felt to be addicted to be to, to be addicted to porn and it read almost identical to people who are you know who like the messages that i get for people who can't stop eating ultra processed foods almost identical that people when they get addicted to porn it's basically the same thing. They'll report a numbed pleasure response, an overriding of satiety mechanisms. You know, it's basically like when you're watching too much porn and you're and you're hooked on that, you can't like you can't get enough. You're like you're watching one video and you, you're already thinking about the video that you want to click on, mm. you know, or mm -hmm. the the search term that you want to go to mm -hmm. while you're watching the. The same thing happens when we're basing our diets around these ultra processed foods. So it's a big problem. It's the it's the pornographication of food that's essentially what has happened you know thanks to the industrial <laughs> food complex you know yep that's a really good metaphor to use man because yeah. it makes a lot of fucking sense and uh it's really interesting to think of it that way and then to have and it's not to say that all right don't ever indulge in porn just do it mindfully like yeah. sparingly like have some fucking have some discipline and some respect. Like it's okay if you go if you go buy a voodoo donut and you're like, wow, I wonder what that bacon glazed donut tastes like. Yeah. Go for it, bro. Like go for it, girl. Like have that thing. Mm -hmm. Just don't have it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and if you're curious about what this one thing might look like if you saw this sexual act, like it's all right. Like it's okay. We're humans. We're gonna be curious. We might get turned on by something. We might learn something. But if you're sticking to it and you're thinking about your all day and it's like, how can I get to my next fix? And you're driving in your car and it's like straight over to Pornhub and it's or you're driving and you went straight over to the 7 Eleven to to rip a Slurpee down as you're doing this and then maybe sipping your Slurpee and watching Pornhub at the same time, like you might be like a a slave to some of these like very base level urges yeah that are not really going to be productive yeah i love the word that you used respect have have respect for for whether it's sugar which is not inherently toxic but it's definitely deserving of respect um you know just because it's so easy to over consume um i've reframed my relationship with coffee to have more respect for coffee because i found myself just drinking it ritualistically every single day um, you know, one or two or three cups. And I just found myself get, I was, well, first of all, I was addicted to it. And then there was like this incremental creep where I was just consuming more and more of it. I, you know, my first, that, that one coffee that I would have in the morning suddenly became, uh, you know, an incredibly strong and much larger coffee in the morning. And then I was having one in the afternoon to self-treat the withdrawal that I was feeling from the morning coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I actually have worked over the past couple of months to, to reframe my relationship with coffee to have more respect for it now i'm drinking it very deliberately um not every single day primarily in the pre-workout setting i think it's a really good pre-workout um and at a, at a at a much lower dose i'm trying to just drink like the minimal effective dose to yeah. feel good to get what i need from it um so i love that i love that idea. i think like people if people can learn to have a little bit more tolerance for sitting with these things like if you're a little tired instead of reaching for something and i struggle with this too you know if i'm a little tired i will reach for the caffeine or reach for nicotine or reach for some other source be like oh, i'm just a little bit tired and then there's a little voice like you can fix this right away no worries you know and uh and i think and i think that kind of tired feeling is something i have less tolerance for than i do the hunger feeling because the hunger i've fasted enough and i've done enough different dietary practices from keto to you know what all these different practices to absolutely cutting out food entirely to intermittent fasting all these things like hunger i'm like yeah yeah yeah, yeah i hear you like whatever we'll go i'll get to you i'll get to you when you know when i got a good option but like if i'm tired you know it's like 
fuck it, where's that next fucking Starbucks? Like, you know, like, where's my, where's my can of snooze? You know, like, where's that thing? But I noticed that I'm happier and I'm better when I make different choices. So if I'm a little tired, you know, especially in the winter, it's great because I have a really cold pool. I know that a much better choice is if I'm a little tired, if I swim 10 laps in my cold pool, I'm going to come out of there and I'm going to feel so much better than if I just hammer a oat milk latte or like, you know, suck on a snooze for 10 minutes or something like that you know like there's just different choices that you can make that are going to be accretive to your to your day and working out is another thing like when you're a little bit tired you may not want to work out but when you work out and when you start sweating like all of that positive feedback loop all of that momentum starts to come online and then all of a sudden you feel great and you didn't need to use a bunch of these different temporary crutches yeah yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we're, exercise is deserving of respect too. I mean, I, I injured my low back squatting in, improperly. You got to have respect for the squat and the deadlift. And if you're just like going to throw yourself into those moves, no bueno. Dude, know? I'm still fucked up from a few things. Like, so before on it, I discovered kettlebells. And at that point, I'm still pretty strong, pretty athletic. And I didn't know how to properly do a snatch. I didn't know how to deflect on the downswing of the snatch. So I was always like pulling my pulling my shoulders for like the way that i was doing it was causing a lot of strain i still have like mid-back issues from mm -hmm. doing snatches without really knowing how to do a kettlebell snatch and pushing it to show off like oh, i could fucking snatch this 72 no fucking problem i got this shit but not doing it right and then you have to deal with that you have to deal with these things that you pattern so it's like having a little respect and then starting off light hopefully getting some advice and coaching and like understanding what you're actually doing biomechanically is going to really help you there too as well super good advice yeah for sure yeah it's important um it's just so many yeah there's so many things but this is all part of the learning the the learning process you know i mean you learn as you go um and without my my low back injury i wouldn't be as as aware of form elsewhere in the gym now mm. and everything that i do i'm very you know, like my ego has been checked. And so now I'm, uh, you know, I'll go for like lighter weights and I focus on form. And, and, and so that's kind of like what guides my workouts now. I'm much more intuitive. Um, and I focus on, on form and concentration. And if not for the pain, you know, of what I experienced with my mom, I wouldn't be on this path, you know, writing about health and, and trying to learn everything I can about, about how to live optimally, today in the year 2020 you and know? that's the that's the stoic perspective alchemizing all of these challenges as gifts you know like really understanding that whatever challenge you're experiencing is an opportunity to either alchemize that for yourself or share this idea this wisdom this thing that you learned that helped you that might help somebody else you know and that's that makes it something that instead of regretting it you're like oh i'm grateful for that because it opened up this new level of awareness and this new realm of study and this new respect for this certain practice yeah yeah 100 percent. so i'm just a student but um but yeah but i'm dedicated to learning as much as i can sharing as much as i can and uh and being healthy helping people that i care about and not not endure what what my, my my family had to endure i don't think i would wish what my mom had on my worst enemy and um and you know again like this is a how nutrition and lifestyle and all this stuff relates to the brain, our risk for cancer, our risk for heart disease. I mean, there are no black and white answers. I mean, science is continually evolving. It's a method of finding things out. You know, it's not the end all be all arbiter of truth. And so that's why I think, you know, it's great to be evidence based. Um, but I think it becomes problematic when you become evidence bound, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's where you have to allow intuition and ancestral wisdom to kind of permeate your worldview a little bit uh sort of open the windows up to that because you know science as it currently stands like doesn't have all the answers yeah well look at the research in psychedelic medicine there you go you know like 20 years ago there was hardly any and you know it was very easy for someone to say oh yeah this is neurotoxic this is gonna it's gonna even make holes in your brain blah 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 and or like woo woo or yeah yeah exactly and then all of a sudden you start getting this research from organizations like johns hopkins and hefter and maps who are doing these clinical trials yeah. and all of a sudden you're like oh actually this is now what the evidence is showing you know so 
evidence is always advancing. You know, there's a certain point where everybody was believing that margarine was going to be better for you than butter. Oh God, yeah. You know, and like it was like, whoops, yeah. <laughs> you know, like blew that one. So yeah. let's try that one again. Yeah, and because that's what the science, and I'm using air quotes. If you're listening to this, you know, that's what that's what the science of the time dictated would be better for our health, right? Using using partially hydrogenated soybean oil instead of butter which we know you know is just was the worst uh worst advice ever you know yeah. trans fats there's no sa- there's literally no safe level of, tra- of of artificially created uh man-made trans fat consumption and the funny thing is that trans fats still permeate the food supply i mean if you look at any vegetable oil any grain and seed oil canola oil corn oil soybean oil um they all have a small but significant amount of trans fats in them just because of the production process. And the way that it has, the way it, that's now a, a line on any nutritional fact that you have to kind of look at trans fats. And the way that they categorize it is if it's below a certain threshold, and I don't know exact, that exact number, yeah. then you can, you can call it zero. Yeah. But it's not zero. You're yeah. rounding down. Yeah. Just you know because it I mean? says zero doesn't mean that it's 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 actually zero. Right. It just means that you're able to round down based upon the regulations that you have. So the accumulation of these things, yeah, is still going to be there. Like you just you really can't trust big food to have your back. No, you can't. You know. Yeah. I mean, say soybean oil has you know let's just say it has 0.45 grams of trans fats per serving. And you pour a tablespoon and a half of uh, sal- commercial salad dressing made with soybean oil all over your salad. You're basically you're essentially getting a gram and a half of trans fats uh, in your salad, which is supposed to be the healthiest meal of the day, right? Like the, mm. the salad. It's like that's what most people eat when they're trying desperately to wean themselves off of the standard American diet and to get a little bit healthier. So they take their their greens and they pour you know this commercial salad dressing all over it. And uh, of course, you know, you'll see claims on the label probably that it has no saturated fat, no cholesterol, which, you know, so stupid because, you know, vegetables don't manufacture cholesterol anyway. But um, but what they're doing is they're sabotaging their, you know, their healthiest meal of the day with those trans fats, which, you know, the consumption of trans fats creates inflammation in your arteries directly related to increased risk for heart disease, early mortality, worse memory function, Alzheimer's disease, you name it. So... I was having a talk with uh, we have a we have a food scientist on our team who's working with us through different stuff, and we always are intensely focused not only on the quality of well on the quality of every single ingredient, including any coloring we used or whatever. So if we want something to be more red, we're using beet. You know, if we want something, we're trying to find like the natural sources. So we're brainstorming different colors. Like we wanted something to be more blue, and we're like, ah, oh, blue's tricky. You know, like, what can we use? Well, let's maybe some blue green algae would do it. Maybe some like trying to figure out ways that we can color something with something that's actually accretive to your health. But then we were laughing because, and it's it's and it's this kind of tragic laugh. Like red forty, for example, is like one of the most toxic artificial colorings. And I'm thinking red forty. That means hypothetically, there's thirty nine, at least thirty (laughs) nine other options. But still, people are going for, let's go with 40. It just has that right hue. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's massively carcinogenic, but they don't care. They're like, eh, 40 gives it that color we're really looking for. You got 39 other options that are going to be better. Yellow six, bad. That means one, two, three, four, seven, eight, maybe way better. I mean, they still may not be good, but like we know that there's certain one of these certain of these numbers yeah. that are just shitty, and they'll use them anyways. Yeah, yeah. I would I would bet that they're all similarly, you know, functioning. It's sort and you know I'm saying that just you know out of spe, you know in speculation, but it's sort of I would imagine it to be similar to what's now happening with BPA, where you know bisphenol A is something that's been used to create hard plastics. You'll see it in reusable water bottles. It's used to make CDs and furniture and things like that um cds what are those like yeah right (laughs) um but yeah it's 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 pretty much everywhere bisphenol a it's well known to to function as a xenoestrogen it acts like estrogen in the body Um, and consumers rightfully so have become increasingly aware of bpa and what manufacturers have done is they've removed bpa but they replace it with other chemicals for which there's less evidence but there's no reason to suspect that they're any uh you know less malevolent and so they'll replace BPA with BPS or BPF. And, um, 
And so it's a, it's a big problem. It's like a chemical, you know, it's a, it's a game of chemical whack-a-mole where as soon as consumers become aware of one compound, you know, the industry is quick to sort of like remove it and then proudly, loudly exclaim that it's been removed, you mm. know, almost like a health claim um, or like a marketing point. But then, you know, we don't know what they've replaced these compounds with. So I would imagine the same thing is true for these, you know, for the colorings and things like that. And I don't know enough about a food coloring to, uh, to, to make a comment on them. But yeah, I mean, whether it's, it's, you know, the oils that are being used, trans fats, or, you know, the, 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 the chemicals being used to create food packaging. Um, I just think that it's, they're, they're all deserving of a little bit more sort of skepticism and reserve. Um, so yeah, I would agree. No with doubt. That. No yeah. doubt. Well, shit, man. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me again, man. This Dropping is some uh, knowledge. Really appreciate it. Love any chance I get to hang with you, and um, loved having you on my podcast. And you're welcome back whenever you want to. Yeah, man. Jump on. Yeah, we might make that happen soon. That'd be awesome. I hope so. The Genius Life, and when this podcast releases, I'm assuming it's going to be out and available everywhere. Available everywhere. Yeah, you can go to geniuslifebook.com uh, to pick up the book. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, and then I'm also super active on Instagram, Max Lugavir. L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. And then I also have a podcast of my own. It's also called The Genius Life. So keep it simple. Come check me out, say hi, and pick up the book. That would be awesome. Do it. Thanks, everybody. Be healthy. Have fun. Love each other. Much love. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to AubreyMarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.